coming to this event, it gives me the opportunity to bring together the, a world of ideas about history and art and culture and society with the world of creation and storytelling, that is to say, the head and the hands. And that's probably an important note as my kind of way into this uh, work. I'm a university professor, so I, I work a lot or spend far too much time in my head. And when I started to make bread, it, it uh, kind of opened up a whole new way of seeing the world. And then I discovered that there's a whole world of bread heads out there, and from that, uh, a story to be told. Uh, the second part of my presentation will be a 10-minute uh, uh, sample of this film in process. But um, what I want to do off the top here, though, is talk about the idea of bread in art uh, in a kind of broad overview kind of way. Up on the screen, Jean-François uh, Millet, The Gleaners, and Charlie Chaplin's great film, Modern Times. In some ways, this kind of spans the ideas of, uh, not the time period so much, but the uh, ideas that I'm interested in. Uh, actually, uh, Peter calls bread, you know, the process of bread from wheat to eat. So the wheat harvesting in, in the Gleaners image uh, is, is the wheat part, obviously. The Charlie Chaplin image in modern times uh, is a kind of different version of that because Chaplin, uh, this is a film made in 1936. It begins with the tramp character working on, the, uh, on an assembly line. We don't know what they're making. It doesn't matter. It's just this idea of regimentation of the body. And in fact, the character gets eaten by the machine, by the machinery of modern industry. Uh, and along the way, uh, he kind of uh, gets tangled up with different kind of adventures in food and industry. In fact, this image here is uh, the, the eating machine. Uh, the tramp character, it's lunchtime at the factory, and the tramp character is strapped into a machine that is sold or promoted to the factory owner as something result. of uh, innovation and progress. The workers won't have to stop. The machine will feed the body, and the hands can keep working, uh, you know, assembling whatever they're assembling. And it turns into a complete disaster, uh, including actually a mechanized pie in the face. So it's a kind of ode to early cinema as well as Chaplin, the last great holdout uh, of, of the silent era. So uh, just as a kind of reference point that uh, uh, wheat to the screen of dreams. And I'll get back to these images in a little bit. But before we get, uh, or to get from the head to the hands, you have to go through the heart. Uh, and before we can think about art, or culture, or politics, or history, we have to eat. And so as Bertolt Brecht said in his uh, great play, Three Penny Opera, However much you twist, whatever lies you tell, food is the first thing morals follow on. So what Brecht is telling us is the in integral relationship between food and uh, the morality, the functioning of, uh, of society. Brecht always connected freedom to eating, and thus his, his other insight that I have up there, uh, justice is the bread of the people. And indeed, we know from the French Revolution to the Arab Spring, that bread has had a central role in struggles for social justice. Without bread, people starve. In making bread, we have a great expression of human creativity. And that's, in some ways, the underlying theme of my presentation. Bread is the metaphor through which we can understand the world in which we live and through which we can survive in the world since it's the only metaphor that we can eat. For the bread to rise, there needs to be fermentation created by bacterial culture. So culture, that category we give to art and creativity and the life of the mind. So if you're looking for images of bread in art, you can go back to, to uh, ancient times, this mosaic uh, from, third, from the uh, third century AD. Uh, when we look at art from this time period, it's not understood as individual expression, but as a narrative of the time. 
And artists could be understood kind of like a baker in a community, nurturing uh, the world in which they live, nurturing their part of the world. Depictions of grain and bread are found throughout Roman archaeological sites. Not surprising, bread was a staple, and the surviving artwork tells us the story of daily life, of survival. When we start jumping ahead, uh, you know, another millennium, uh, bread and art tells us not just of survival, but of social values. So Caravaggio, the supper at Emmaus, uh, is created in Catholic Italy in 1601. This is a narrative painting of Christ breaking bread uh, with his disciples after the resurrection. And what's really interesting about the painting, at, at least from our perspective as bread heads, is the, the food on the table is given great prominence here. And it's a, it's a primary example of uh, art being made at the uh, uh, bequest of the, of the Catholic Church. Something very different is going on in northern Italy by the 16th century with a shift away from the patronage of uh, the arts by the church, which begins in the Netherlands, uh, where the Protestants break from uh, the Catholic church. And we see a rise uh, in secular subjects, like landscape and the still life. And this is a, a great example, Clara Peters' Breakfast Still Life with Bread. Uh, Clara Peters was the first major Dutch uh, female painter of this era. Women would paint still life images uh, because they didn't have access to training in anatomy as, their, as would their male counterparts. So in all times and places, social conditions create the subject. And so we have an artist creating this subject because that's the, the world they have access to. Uh, what we see is the depiction of the elements of everyday life where bread is prominent. Uh, <laughs> among the foods that were available at the time. And the picture gives us a sense of local pride and the celebration of abundance. And this is an image, this period of the still life is a uh, painting stripped free of narrative. So uh, when we look at the Carvaccio painting, it's trying to tell us a story. Uh, so it's a narrative of sorts. And that changes with the rise of the, of the still life. Perhaps the most famous Dutch uh, painting or Dutch artist of the era, uh, Vermeer's The Milkmaid, made around 1657 or 58, uh, also known and more accurately as the kitchen maid, as a milkmaid is one, would be a servant who's actually milking the cows. But in any case, uh, one of the interesting things about this image is uh, representing the dignity of the maid. And that was somewhat unusual at the time. Often the servants would be depicted as more kind of comic uh, foils. Uh, and that's directed or dictated by who is commissioning the work, who owns the painting. And it's certainly not the, the working or the servant class. Uh, just as interesting and outside of the frame is that it's the wealth of the spice trade and the Dutch uh, kind of dominance of, of the spice trade at this time that makes this artwork possible. Uh, it is the wealthy uh, trader, trading merchants who are uh, the patrons of the arts at this time period. So this is a, a key way that food is connected with art uh, and that art is connected with global trade and geopolitics. But back to the painting, uh, it's the image of food that is as prominent, as beautiful, and as interesting as is the character. Jumping around geographically and through time, Jean-Francois Millet, woman baking bread in 1854. So same artist as uh, the Gleaners. Um, at this time, so uh, mid-19th century, uh, Millet's work is part of a movement uh, to idealize the countryside in reaction to industrialization. It's, it's a part of uh, a kind of movement of artists who are reacting against 
uh, the rise of, of, of the modern steam age. So it's, uh, and it's an example of how artists are representing the direct experience of everyday life. So realism. And realism takes many forms, uh, always though reflects, if unintentionally, the social and political contexts of the time. In the mid to late 19th century, it leads to modernism, which is characterized in part by artists trying to capture the fleeting speed and energy of modern life, at this point shaped by uh, the locomotive age, the age of steam, uh, and the rise of advertising and consumerism. The Malay painting isn't there yet. It's kind of a reaction against what's that, that kind of uh, set of ideas. Outside of the world of art proper, uh, visual culture and advertising in the late 19th century, early 20th century, corresponds uh, in North America with the massive uh, wave of European immigration to North America, and the colonization of the American Midwest and the Canadian prairies for wheat cultivation. So the Canada West image, kind of representative of that, this idea of abundance and bounty, uh, and the kind of joy of, of this open uh, landscape. Uh, lots of people talked about these images as if they're trying to represent something like a new Garden of Eden. And that's really interesting because the images also uh, were designed to erase the or original inhabitants of the land. Uh, and so images always both reveal and conceal uh, things that are going on at, in any given time. But in any case, bread making in this context would be uh, depicted as women's labor. Uh, often these kinds of uh, propaganda images would have, you know, men with their sleeves rolled up, tilling the soil, working the land. Not so much images of, of women's labor, except in this case, this woman with a child. Uh, and it's a very interesting image, and, and in, in a way is kind of the, one of my personal um, entry points to this project. There are a variety of, of uh, entry points. I think when I, when I uh, think of this time period, I think of my own grandmother, who was an immigrant to the Canadian prairies uh, in 1906, who bore 17 children, uh, and for whom it was said that baking was her hobby. Now think about that. She went through 50 pounds of flour a week. And making bread was but one part of a hard life with no time to think about this idea of a hobby and certainly no time to think about art. And at the same time that that's going on, uh, the nature of baking, like the nature of uh, modern life, is being transformed by industrial production. In the case of baking, of course, steel roller mills and commercial yeast. It's invented earlier, but it's, it's really becoming, you know, the dominant form of, of production by this point. And all of that is as far from immigrant farm labor as from the art world. So when I try to you know, get my head around what is it I'm doing in this kind of research and, and creative work, in some ways, it's investigating ideas of time. These are parallel worlds that suggest that there are multiple experiences of, of time, and bread is at the center. In other words, at the very same time that you know, immigrant laborers are toiling on this land, a land that is, you know, erasing its uh, first inhabitants uh, in the, you know, the, the art studios of the great cities of the world. All kinds of brilliant avant-garde innovations are being made. And on the industrial side, uh, production is being transformed. And with that transformation, uh, the one's way of, our, our way of life in the modern world is, is transformed. Back to Chaplin. In some ways, that's what, what uh, Chaplin is, is getting on in modern times. This is probably the most famous image uh, from this film. Uh, I teach this film often in introductory film history courses, and I always ask, 
who is familiar with this image, almost everybody, but at this point, who has actually seen the film, almost or probably no one until I show it to them. Uh, so, it, but the image is is uh, speaking is still important to us because it's probably still an experience that resonates. It's the tramp character being consumed by the gears of industry, so eaten by the machine. The other image uh, is is a image that recurs in in a multitude of Chaplin films. There are all kinds of references to food, to eating. To eating, to either having no money and not being able to eat, or having a gross amount of food and overabundance, and all kinds of gags, including in modern times, where the tramp character um, gets himself arrested and thrown in prison so that he can eat. It's not that it would be good food, but it would be at least a piece of bread. Uh, so the the place of food is is really important in this in this work. Well, let's ask him who has seen Modern Times. So more than a representative sample of film students at a contemporary art school. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. But if you haven't seen it, see it. One of the great films of all time. So outside the movie theater, uh, the bread lines. Bread is associated with the bare minimum sustenance given to the needy during the Depression. So Chaplin's comedy was no joke. It was a way of helping us see the real conditions of the world during the Depression. This is a great image of uh, Margaret Burke White, often referred to as the breadline photo. In fact, the people in the photo are not lining up in a breadline, but it's, it does speak, it is of this time period, and it does speak to this, uh, uh, you know, it's like the, the uh, when you have to choose between the myth and the story, the myth is, tells the story sometimes in a truer way, and that's, that's the excuse I'm going to hold on to in, in using that. As an aside, the history of breadlines is, is pretty interesting. We use that term uh, you know, as shorthand to think about the Depression era. And that's because that's when breadlines became much more visible. Uh, they were uh, you know, during the day. Prior to that, uh, you know, in, in a city like New York City at the turn of the century, there would be breadlines, but they would be at midnight. So you had to be really hungry and you had to be kind of shamed to line up very late at night to get a, a chunk of bread and a, a mug of very sweet coffee to kind of choke it down with. So there was no, then that was, you know, social assistance of the time. You had to really, you know, want it and it was kept out of sight. It becomes, you know, visible to the mainstream as you're coming out of the Chaplin movie and, you know, there's a bread line. And movies at the time period also played a really important role. They were a kind of, relief valve, a kind of break, because movies have always been cheap and accessible to, uh, to the working classes. But popular culture, but meanwhile, avant-garde artists in the 20th century have used bread as one part of a project of transforming our ways of seeing, with the idea that art is not, by this point, something uh, to think of as an object of beauty separate from ourselves, but something instead that's created in an encounter with an audience. And like bread bakers, artists understand that the mobilization of all of our senses is in play. But important for artists is playing with and transforming the idea of taste and confronting notions of good taste, and, uh, which are associated with you know, existing dominant uh, social institutions. So the various art movements that emerge in the early 20th century are a reaction against the traditions of art and the ideas of what is art and what are the materials of art and uh, who gets to be an artist. So Duchamp's famous urinal up here on the screen. And these are all a direct response to the social and 
political conditions of the time. Uh, no more so than this movement called Dada, which uh, emerges after World War I uh, and is then followed by surrealism in the mid-1920s. So Dada, one of the founders of, of the Dada movement, is, it's a nonsense word uh, that is really meant as, as part of the whole movement is to kind of poke at the nonsense of, of, the, of the ordered regime of modern life, which is a regime that uh, resulted in the violence and, and uh, madness of world war. So one of the founders of Dada, Tristan Zera, wrote the Dada Manifesto in 1918. And in it he says, science says we are servants of nature. Everything is in order. Make love and bash your brains in. So a direct reference to war. And he goes on, I am against systems. The most acceptable system is on principle to have none. To complete oneself, to perfect oneself in one's own littleness. To fill the vessel with one's individuality. To have the courage to fight for and against thought the mystery of bread. What is bread doing in there? It, just, it kind of gets tacked on. Uh, and I think it's an image of uh, the artist rejecting the social norms and traditions after the chaos of World War I, but also declaring that art is not to be found in you know, traditional materials and methods, but perhaps in the ordinary object. Uh, in the everyday, and something as commonplace and at the, uh, at the time as separate from the world of art as the mystery of bread. Another expression that's kind of along these lines uh, was published uh, later in a book called The Artist and Writer's Cookbook. Um, comes out in the, in the 1960s, but is from the artist Man Ray, and it is the menu for a Dada day. Dejeuner. Take the olives and juice from one large jar of prepared green or black olives and throw them away. In the empty jar, place several steel ball bearings. Fill the jar with machine oil to prevent rusting. With this delicacy, serve a loaf of French bread 30 inches in length, painted a pale blue. So there you have it. Painted bread, known in English as blue bread, favorite food for blue birds. And he made several versions of this uh, painted bread. The first in 1958, he painted a loaf of stale uh, uh, bread. Uh, but the mice in his studio ate through the paint and consumed the loaf. And as I was thinking about this, I wrote, destroyed the loaf. And then I had to cross that out because I realized... Uh, first of all, it's not right. Bread is there for consumption, so the mice did what should be done with bread. But more importantly, uh, art is not to be thought of as something that's permanent. That it is something that is going to be made and unmade in a relationship with, with uh, an audience, and that audience may not be separate from, uh, from the work of art at all, but be part of it. And they may not, they may in fact include the mice. The image is also pretty cool because it's trying to talk about the idea of balance and it's defying the idea of balance. The bread is, is, is covering both sides of the scale. These are just a, a couple of examples of artists associated with the Dada movement and using bread or references to bread. The Surrealist movement grows out of this a bit later and these movements overlap for a while. Um, and the surrealist most well-known in the popular imagination is Salvador Dali, who took bread as a defining feature of his art. In fact, he wanted bread to be as well-known in relation to him as an artist as his famous mustache. But probably at this point, we, we know the mustache more, unless you're kind of in the art world. Um, he's a surrealist, but these are you know, very much realist images. The first painted 1926, very early in his career, uh, actually just finished art school. Uh, the second completed a, a day after the end of World War II. And there's an affinity in the work, in the subject matter, 
Um, but the 1945 painting, very interesting, um, the heel of the loaf balanced at the edge of a table. So you could, one could read it as uh, prophetic of the place of bread in the survival of people during wartime. Realist images from Dali. But Dali was a great trickster, comedian, kind of anarchic comedian, and a bit crude at times. Catalan bread, anthropomorphic bread, 1932. So what Dali wanted to do was to use the image of bread uh, and through this parody the intellectual uh, pretensions of Freud, especially around ideas of sexuality. And, and more from that, and this is part of his kind of self-aggrandizement, Dali wanted to uh, think or represent the bread as if it's the body of the artist, uh, and who saw himself as the savior of modern art. And he wanted his art to be uh, an object of mass consumption, like bread. Dali also made a uh, bird cage out of bread for a performance of which a bird had to eat its way to freedom. Uh, in the 1970s, Dali uh, collaborated with uh, uh, French baker Lionel Poilin to create a uh, bedroom entirely furnished with bread. Uh, so there's Dali with a bread hat. And the, uh, the other image is uh, from the Poilin uh, bakery. They have to, it's a chandelier, though it's, at this point, the idea of what is the original work of art also doesn't matter. The uh, chandelier has to be remade every, every couple of years for obvious reasons. Uh, it's an interesting collaboration. Uh, uh, Pierre Poilin, the founder of the famous Poilin Bakery, had a very uh, interesting uh, affinity with the artists in, in the neighborhood around his bakery and would, at times, trade images, trade bread for paintings of bread. So bread for bread. Elsewhere, uh, also in the surrealist uh, mode, René Magritte, the intimate friend. So meaning is cultivated within the work of art, free of any external logic. While it's realist in technique, it's not meant to represent anything other than itself as a painting. Moving a little closer to, to the contemporary era and the rise of pop art in the 1960s, when we say pop art, the popular imagination, we think of Andy Warhol, lots of other artists at the time uh, working in this mode. The first, James Rosenquist, American artist, White Bread, 1964. So this is a painting that really is uh, kind of uh, on the cusp between the earlier period of abstract expressionism, which is dominant post-World War II and throughout the 50s, uh, and the emergence of pop art, which is more representative in the Coretta Kent image. But the Rosenquist, it's actually done in oil paint, which is unlike most pop artists who tended to work in screen printing and use techniques that were uh, familiar and available from the world of advertising. That's what they were referencing. But Rosenquist is working in oil, and he's interested in the detail. He's interested in line and shape and form and that uh, blast of color. So it's a painting that's very much about painting. It's about shape, form, line, and abstraction. This is a kind of hybrid work because it does reference white bread, but it's also got its leg in, in this earlier era of representation. With the Coretta Kent image, enriched bread, this is much more in the familiar mode of pop art using the graphic elements and techniques that are borrowed from the world of advertising. And Artists were doing this because they wanted to reflect the modern age and the ephemeral nature of life within an advertising-saturated consumer culture. 
Just a couple of images from, from that period. This is by, can no, by no means be exhaustive. Uh, artists continue to make use of bread in all kinds of ways, uh, too many to name. So I'll just give one more example before switching over to the film. This is a uh, Swiss-born, currently New York-based artist, Urs Fischer. Uh, it's untitled uh, Bread House, 2004. It is a full-size Swiss chalet made entirely out of bread and made uh, for the, to, let, to, to let it decay and let it be eaten by birds and other animals, to let it decompose. So what's important quite often with contemporary artists using something ephemeral like bread is they want to mess around with the idea of permanence and tradition and materials and the idea of what is the proper uh, conditions and material for the work of art. Actually, we see that going on way earlier in the 20th century as well. So it's interesting that artists today are still working with those problems and, and raising those questions, the questions of, you know, what is the work of art? And in fact, like this, in this piece, the work of art should break down, should decompose, um, as will all of us. Just as bread decomposes in our bodies and just as our bodies decompose in the earth. So all of this provides some uh, context of the, of the history and context that I'm, I'm trying to work in and, and understand. Uh, but my own project has gone in, in its own uh, direction by now, kind of outside of uh, the work of art, the traditional art world proper. Uh, making a film about bread as a way of telling a story about culture and society. And I kind of had to think about what is this project about, in part because I had to put together some notes for this talk. But uh, as I work through the project and interview uh, people and collect material, I've realized, uh, perhaps contra to the purpose of this uh, conference, this is not a project about how to bake, but why. Not about what is the best loaf of bread, but how is it that we come to think about bread in certain ways at certain times. Not an accounting of who are the best bakers, though there are plenty of them in the film, but really about the fundamental desire to bake. So fundamentally, uh, bread is a vehicle for storytelling. Uh, and if the invention of bread is a marker of the rise of complex civilization, storytelling is likewise a marker, a defining marker of what it is that makes us human. And so I'll show you 10 minutes of this film, uh, which is a film really about bread and storytelling. Every loaf is representative of exactly how much we care for each other and all the way backwards to the ground. What is more fundamental to human existence than making bread and eating it? It's not that hard. People have been doing it for a long time. People have been baking a gazillion loaves of bread. Yours isn't so precious. Your loaf that you're making isn't so precious, and yet it, it's everything. Bread has been the very founding piece of what created civilization. Grain growing has been the thing that got people to settle in regions, and from this came written languages and art, music. I mean, of course, we've had music all, all throughout human existence, but beginning to, to build instruments, to build orchestras, things like that, this all came from the security that was offered by essentially a loaf of bread. In order to make a good bread or to make a good story, so that it can nurture and feed. You need to really um, have a sense of the living quality of all the ingredients of the story. And you have to really add love and patience. And you make it not just for yourself, but for others. The task of shaping dough, which is this spongy, elastic, gooey thing, is akin to the art of tying a knot with something that's viscoelastic and at the same time 
fragile. So you have to kind of finesse this kind of gooey blob that has a certain degree of elasticity, a certain degree of, of, of viscosity into a knot so it holds its shape and then it leavens. And then you, you know, subject it to some source and quantity of heat. And then you have the, the miracle of bread. Making bread gives me hope because of the conversations I end up having with other people that stem from making bread. For me, bread can be an incredibly meditative process. It can also be an incredibly frustrating process because it's unknowable. You know, it's this, it's another reason why I love it. It's like what else is like common and familiar and then utterly unknowable and alien at the same time. Only bread and people. Real bread is why we are bakers, is why we wake up early every morning because of fermentation. Real bread combines flour, water, natural yeast. Real bread for me is about three ingredients. Combine flour, water, natural yeast. Real bread combine your own interpretation, your own intention, your own fermentation, your own real bread. Combine some of your understanding of what you've been grasping and after that it's going to be the magical. And then make your own real bread. It was like one day where maybe the microclimate was right, there was the, the temperature was right, and so we baked the bread, and I, I gave one to my mom, and she said, this bread tastes like cake. And it was like, oh my God, it was really, really great. It was like a real nice loaf of bread. We ate it all, and uh, I tried to always mimic that. I think I can still remember what happened, how it tasted, but how it is all came together, I, I, I'm not quite sure. And I hope I never find that perfect bread because maybe then a little bit the quest is over. But on the flip side also, I uh, worked later on, I worked in Miami in the Artisan Bread Bakery there and we made bread, also Falcon bread for an airline. When I went back to Germany, I, I brought some bread for my mom because they served it actually in a plane. So next morning I came back, tell me mom, so what do you think? I mean, aren't you proud of your son? And he says, son, I, we didn't have much to eat in the, during the war over there and I have eaten my share of bad food. But quite possibly, this was the worst bread I ever eaten in my whole life. And I'm like, oh my God, what happened? Why? What are you adding? And then it dawned to me. I actually put calcium propionate, this this chemical, to prevent to uh, to add more shelf life to it because that's what the airline uh, required. And I'm saying, oh my God, I sold my soul. I cannot believe it. From this bread that tastes like cake to the worst bread possible. It's a particular vision of bread that has held a powerful grip on people for, you know, 100, 150 years. And in many ways, although its aura has faded greatly in recent times, its, its hold on our imagination is not as great. But this is really an artifact of, of a vision of industrial utopia. The idea of, of the conquest of scarcity and want through technology. Um, belief in the possibility of industrial perfection saving us um, from savagery and, and uh, descent into chaos. Even as a kid growing up in the 70s and the 80s, I remember Wonder Bread and Twinkies because I wasn't allowed to have it because I had, I had artist parents who were alternative and would <laughs> bake their own loaves of peasant bread. My grandmother told stories about being in the camps after the war, the detainee camps, and they would dream of bread. The people would write songs and poems about bread. They'd try to make bread, but they didn't have the ingredients. 
That's what they wanted. They didn't want chocolate. Well, I'm sure they did. But you know, they, they wanted the fundamental, which is a loaf of bread. And the greatest luxury is learning not to make bread. So there's that whole feminist angle too. Nellie McClung, who was one of our great suffragettes in Canada, wrote this hilarious book called Sowing Seeds and Danny. And in it, she's got a passage where she talks about how the main character, Nellie Slater, will not be a good wife for this young man in town because she doesn't know how to make her own baking soda. She doesn't know how to bake bread and she buys canned goods. If you're in the counterculture movement, whole wheat breads and whole wheat flour kind of represented a step into a counterculture that puts you outside the mainstream. So it had a lot of political implications. Bread always has a lot of levels of meaning. You know, it exists on political levels, on philosophical levels, on symbolic levels, metaphorical, as well as the literal level of just bread is bread. The process from the earth to the table is a journey that really parallels the journey of life, including the various stages of transformation that the ingredients go through from wheat harvested, turned into flour, flour turned into dough, dough leavened, brought to life by the baker, the dough taken to the oven, the life taken away from the dough uh, when the temperature of the dough reaches 140 degrees, the leaven, the yeast, has to sacrifice and give up its life. So the bread eating is the, is the motive for the puppet show. The puppet show is just the vehicle to make that possible. People wouldn't eat bread together unless you create an occasion for it. They are lacking the occasions to do that. They only know the commas of doing it, the sellable way. You go, you buy it, you chew it, and you sit it out. That's sufficient, but it isn't. So when you make puppet shows, you create a fancy royal celebratory occasion, and you feed them, and they do something together that they forgot they can do together. When I came here to Glover, I tell this story often, that I'm getting bored with it. I bake, and I put a sign on the farm, free bread, nobody ever came. Then when inflation struck, I put a sign next to it saying, due to inflation, twice as free. Nobody came. Then we started offering it to co-ops and selling it. It goes like hotcakes. <laughs> But the real thing is to not sell it. Because you don't sell food to your mama or to your brother. So why consider other people inferior to mamas and brothers? Please. If the light's up, we, whatever time we have left, we can talk uh, in whatever you're interested in from this presentation. Um, who is familiar with the Bread and Puppet Theater? That's where we end on. Some. So I'll, I'll, not that many. So, I'll, so that's, his name is Peter Schumann. He uh, runs what's called the Bread and Puppet Theater. It's in Glover, Vermont. It was where I, one of the first things I shot for this film, and it really helped me crystallize what it's about. Uh, it's a kind of hippie uh, commune place uh, where bread making is central to, to the show. So every Sunday throughout the summer, they put on shows. They also do parades, and they tour, and so on. But there are these shows every Sunday. And after the show, uh, bread is, is given to the audience. So the artwork nurtures the mind, and our emotions, and intellect, and the bread 
feeds our bodies, and it's the two together. And, but Schumann is a kind of trickster, and he basically says, well, it's actually all about the bread, and not just the bread, but doing it together. Uh, to eat together is a different kind of story than to eat uh, individually. And so the, uh, that really helped crystallize what it's about. Um, while we talk, I know people are going to say, when is the film going to be done? I have no idea. But if you want to put your email address on here, uh, you'll be on the list and you can, you can. Uh, oh, sure. Okay. So sign up if you want. Can I add a little, a quick uh, note to your uh, Peter Schumann story? He's a legendary man in the, uh, well, in the theater world, in the, in the, certainly in the counterculture world. Uh, in 1970, uh, I joined a street theater group called the Stomachache Street Theater Group. It was an offshoot of the bread. There were people that had left uh, Vermont and come down to Boston uh, and started a little uh, theater troupe based on, the, on everything they learned from Peter Schumann. So we're talking a long time ago. So, and I never got to meet him in person, but he must have been a much younger man then. But he always seemed like an old man to us. And He's still as active. Uh, the theater area is down a hill. The oven's up a hill. And he gets the stuff in the oven. And then he runs downhill to start rehearsing. And he's back up later. Right. And, and by the way, I had that anecdote in an earlier cut, but it was too long. Oh, well, so you, I may you, say, uh, I'm going to tell it then since it didn't make the cut. So, that is, so uh, what we would do is at the end of the performance, each night we would do a, a piece, a theater piece that was all done in puppets. We were, we were inside of puppets, and we moved in puppets, and it was all very slow motion, and, and uh, it, was, it was unique. It was avant-garde, and <laughs> I guess it's a good way to say it. And then at the end of the show, we would, we would um, pass loaves of bread to the audience and break bread with the audience, and people would tear off pieces of bread and pass it to everyone else. So every night's performance would end with a, essentially a communion experience of breaking bread. The bread, so the first loaf of bread I ever baked was the bread that uh, we ground the, the flour that day from wheat berries in a hand mill. We ground that wheat, made it with flour, water, salt, and a I think, I'm not even sure if we used yeast or if it was just unleavened, but it was very basic bread. But the experience of breaking the bread at the end and sharing it with everybody in the audience was transformational for the audience. It, it, it was probably the takeaway memory for them, even beyond the imagery of the theater itself. It was very powerful. And I don't know how much it affected my moving, moving into bread later on, but it certainly was a uh, I important experience in my own journey. But for me, it crystallized this idea, of the, the, the power of this most simple of, of things. And that's really the, you know, the other entry point to the film is how to tell the story about, well, all of life <laughs> through the most simple of objects, you know, three ingredients, but always more than just always more in that there's always a story if I, not. I just wanted to add to the Schumann piece because I have a, a Peter Schumann story which is that we were traveling on bike across the Northeast Kingdom my daughter is a year and a half she's 23 now and um, and we'd been biking all day and we got to Bread and Pepper we were bakers and a mill builder it was my um, there's five of us and um, and we got there because we wanted to check it out, and they were like, oh, we're about to have our pageant, and we don't have any room. Can we camp out? No, no, you know, we can't. We don't have room. We're busy. And our friend Roger Jansen, who's a mill builder, he's like 86 now, we're just saying they were exhausted. We've been biking all day. My daughter's in a bike trailer behind me. And, um, and he goes, but, but we're bakers. And they were like, oh, hold on, and went back and got Peter Schumann. And he came, and he was like, welcome. And he brought us in, and they, get, they said, camp out wherever you want. They gave us dinner. They welcomed us back two weeks later to be part of their bread and pack, you know, their circus and pageant. And it was just one of those moments where, like, you know, changed everything. So bread is very important there. <laughs> so tell people you're a baker. Yeah. <laughs> Eric? What, time for one more comment. It seems like a relevant story to tell about Max Fleischmann, of uh, Charles and Max Fleischmann, the Fleischmann brothers who commercialized yeast, that Max had a, uh, a bakery on the, in, in lower Manhattan at the beginning of the 20th century, and the aroma of baking bread coming up through the grates would attract, in those days, what were called bums and vagrants. And uh, 
four or five of them are standing on the grate in the middle of the winter, and they sort of push one off the iceberg and say, can you go ask for bread? And he goes to ask Max Fleischman for bread, and Max says, yes, here's a slice of bread. Anybody else? Gives it to the three other guys on the grate. The next night, there are 20 people online. The night after that, there are many more people online. Max Fleischman said to his workers, I want you to be sure that the line runs out before the bread ever runs out. And he would then go out, it turns out, they discovered this only years later, that he would go out and give coffee and bread, this is like the first New York bread lines, um, to anybody online. Then he'd put up a bulletin board inside the, uh, the bakery so as people came in on the line, they could see if somebody needed workers. It was sort of the first work board ever. And uh, some of his workers would, some of the people in the bakery would complain, you know, there are people coming through the line twice. And Max would say, good, they must have somebody else who's hungry. Follow them home. Make sure that anybody at home has enough bread. And only after he died did his son discover that he had given away a large part of his fortune in both money and bread to all of the area food kitchens and hospitals and so forth. And it's sort of a small little piece in the New York uh, Times about the sort of the original feeder of the bread lines. And this is the guy who invented yeast. Well, didn't invent yeast, but the commercialization of yeast. Well, thank you for that story, Eric. Well, I think that may be a good, a good story to go out and together break some bread and, uh, and you know, continue our, our journey through today. And we'll regather tomorrow. Uh, this is to allow you to break bread at awesome. home. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> courtesy of of uh, Hinkle's, enjoy that. And hey. I will see you outside. Thank you for day one. Uh, some of you I'll see you later on tonight. And we'll, we'll carry on out, outside these walls. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning, breakfast at 7.30.